Okay. I'm joined in our newsroom by John Rees, recently returned from Cairo. Um, John, you've just come back, having spent the last week in the city. Um, you've witnessed the mass gathering on Tuesday. And uh, just give us some sort of idea of the atmosphere that's built up over the last few days to that climax, and then obviously following that, the, the frustration and disappointment of um, Mubarak's statements. Well, I think the first thing to say is that this is an incredibly profound social upheaval. I mean, we've been used in recent years perhaps to watching the so-called colour revolutions where there's a kind of minor change in the machine, a machinery of government and it's all over with a, in, within a couple of days and some you know, acceptable pro-Western figure arrives. That's not what we're talking about in Egypt. We're talking about a, a, a genuine upheaval uh, on the scale of the sort of great classic revolution. So the numbers involved are simply enormous. In the demonstration that I was in, there was two million people in Cairo itself, not only in Tahir Square, but backed up for perhaps half a mile in every direction down main streets, which are as wide as Oxford Street or Regent Street. Um, then there were the demonstrations outside Cairo itself. There's estimates, I don't think we'll ever really know, but estimates vary between four million and eight million uh, people over the whole of Egypt protesting. That means that in, um, I was told, um, 10 Egyptian cities each had over half a million people on the streets. I had an independent report from Mahala, which is the home of the Mahala Kubra textile plant, probably has a population of about a quarter of a million, that 100,000 of those were on the streets. Now these are absolutely enormous, uh, e enormous uh, figures. And Beyond that, beyond the crowds that you see on television screen, one of the things that's happened is the level of kind of self-organisation in the society by ordinary people has been simply enormous. In response to the attempt by the Mubarak government to create a climate of fear by letting loose um, police in civilian clothes and encouraging looting, there's been an absolutely huge growth of popular militias. So when I arrived from the airport and went through downtown Cairo, ev and this is no exaggeration, every single road junction is run by a militia that directs traffic, that organises squads to go around and make sure that looters aren't looting, that has the streets cleaned, um, and that's happening all over. On the other side of the Nile where I was staying, um, in Dokhi, uh, 20 guys would meet every night, a couple of them waiters from the hotel still in their white uniforms with sticks and iron bars and they would patrol the area. A friend of mine who lives in Mardi, which is quite a middle class area in the south of Cairo, said that the, um, the public address system of the mosque is being used to direct the militia to where looters might be. And this is an incredible development in Egyptian society. So it's a very, very profound social process. Um, you mentioned earlier the pro-Mubarak mob and indeed the news over the last day and indeed last night um, was full of pictures of uh, um, conflict between the two sides um, which resulted in several shootings. Um, what sort of effect has this had on the whole dynamic of, uh, of the movement? Um, has it discouraged people in any way from taking to the streets or, um, I mean, what, what sort of general, general effects it had on... on, on well, I mean, it, you, you couldn't have seen two more um, uh, opposed moods on the streets of Cairo than the Tuesday and the Wednesday. The Tuesday when I was there in the mass demonstration, there was a, there was a carnival atmosphere. It was almost as if Mubarak was gone. Uh, it was certainly that people were celebrating the sheer scale of their own mobilisation. People were singing and dancing, literally singing and dancing in the streets. There were um, balconies of some of the political parties were blaring out uh, music and huge numbers of people were dancing below them in the streets around, uh, around Talat Harb in the square itself. There was a, an elation uh, among, among the crowd. Obviously, um, the Mubarak um, statement that evening saying that he was going to step down by September was a feint. And what was being prepared was an attempt to crush the revolution by using um, plainclothes policemen. And we know this for a fact now. There are now pictures time and time again of protesters who captured these people the following day when they attacked the protesters with their police ID cards taken, uh, taken from them. An attempt to crush 
the protest in Tahrir Square. And it was a, a very bloody and violent day yesterday. There were three people killed in the, in the morning, another seven during the course of uh, uh, during the course of last night, all on the side of the uh, of the uh, of the revolutionaries, not among the thugs and the and the, and the police. Um, they almost drove the protesters from the square. They got, I would say, two-thirds of the way across the square before an absolutely massive reaction, you will have seen this on some of the film footage, pushed them right the way back down the square to the Egyptian Museum. There are now barricades at every entrance. And there are marches, uh, there were last night, there are again today, marches, especially from some of the poorer areas, from Mbaba, for instance, to come and support the demonstrators into Tahrir Square, and some signs that some sections, at least at the rank and file level of the army, are beginning to take actions to protect the protesters. So we, we, we are in the middle, uh, as we speak now, we are in the middle of a fantastically dynamic and fluid situation. I don't think anybody can put their hand on their heart and say they know what the outcome of this will be. Mm. Um, on the subject of the military, um, they've uh remained as a sort of a dividing line between the two opposing sides throughout this and haven't come down really on one side or the other. Um, there was an army general talking on the radio this morning um, mentioning that, uh, that having talked to soldiers um, that the soldiers were in fact willing to open fire and direct uh, their aggression towards the Proma Barrack supporters if they um, t um, turned, against, um, turned against the demonstrators again. Um, what do you think it regards the changing role of the military um, in the situation out there, it will, that will we see the military now turn against Mubarak? Well, uh, I think that it has, it has been neutral, but how can we put this? It's been neutral in a way that's more benign towards the protesters mm -hmm. most of the time, not all the time, and not always outside Cairo either but in Cairo certainly, more benign towards the, the, the protesters. For instance, where there were um, roadblocks where the army was present, they were jointly administered by the civilian militia and the army. So as I would go into Tahir Square, a soldier would stop me and ask to see my identity card or in my, you know, in the case of foreigners, their passport. Um, he then would pass me over at, in one case yes, uh, on Tuesday uh, to a, a woman in a full burqa who would then search my, search my bag. I, I joked with them that the British Airport Authority might willing, be willing to adopt this. It might be a lot different to their current policy. But in anyway, it's a, it's a dramatic example of how people are cooperating at the checkpoints um, with the army. On another checkpoint, it's actually the civilians who are checking the identity cards and the military are simply lolling on the tanks um, uh, watching them. As I came out of Tahrir Square um, uh, on Tuesday evening, uh, there are young protesters sitting on the tanks, having their pictures taken as, uh, as, as souvenirs. So I think, um, uh, and, and, and actually even more important than any of that, was the Army's press statement on Monday night, ahead of the Tuesday demonstration, that they would defend the demonstrators' right to protest. Now that was a signal to everybody that it was safe to come, bring your aunt, your uncle, your parents, your children, and it had a, an effect on the scale of the demonstration. So um, I, I think the Army hasn't acted decisively against Mubarak, but it certainly hasn't acted um, directly against the, the protesters and in some ways has made gestures towards the protesters which have facilitated what they're doing. Um, finally, tomorrow is being touted as the day of departure. What next um, following that? If Mubarak goes, who will fill this uh, power vacuum and, uh, and what will happen? Well, you know, every development like this, every serious development like this, opens up a new phase in a revolutionary process. Once the, the existence of the old power and it, it's, it's and Mubarak's determination to cling to power no matter what cost, of course, unifies the forces ranged against him. Once he goes, then different political programs will begin to emerge. And I think that many of the, the workers at Mahalakubra or the steel workers at Helwan who've been part of this process or the poor in Cairo will have a different view of what should come out of the revolution than, say, Mohammed el Baradi will have. Perhaps the Muslim Brotherhood will have a different view again, although their base is predominantly among poor people. Um, uh, poor people as well. So there will then emerge a process of competition, I think, among different political currents for what they think a just and reasonable settlement, a just and reasonable new regime should be. And that, you know, we may find a, a, another phase in the revolution opening up, but I think it's too early to say who exactly will benefit most from the fall of Mubarak at the moment. 
And um, is there any indication among the, the people that you've talked to, the people that on the streets in Cairo, what they're looking for? And not just, you know, the, the fall of Mubarak. What, what are they hoping for? Following well, uh, the, the, you know, it depends who you talk to. I mean, yeah. quite a lot of people simply want an end to a brutal dictatorship and some form of democratic society which enjoys the freedom to organise, the freedom of speech, the freedom to protest, um, um, freedom of, uh, of access to communications, which are things that they've been denied, an end to police oppression, arbitrary uh, arrest, imprisonment, torture and so forth, which have been the hallmarks of the Mubarak regime. And that's certainly one very powerful element. And, and some people, no doubt, would be happy if that were all that happened. I think some people, um, I think particularly among the poor and among working people, think that there has to be some economic change as well. They're sick of the lack of democracy, but they're also sick of the inequality of the tiny plutocratic clique that run the dictatorship. They're uh, fed up of a situation where half the population of 80 million are existing on $2 uh, a, a day, uh, and they want um, social and economic change. Some on the left would like to see those people in power. They'd like to see a transformation which doesn't leave the old rich in charge of the factories but begins to have workers doing so there's a spectrum of opinion there and as I say once Mubarak goes I think there'll be a kind of process of political sorting and debate and argument characteristic of revolutions where people try and sort out which currents they want to back who they trust who they'd like to see represent them. Will you go tomorrow? Well, I go. I'd love to go. Uh, I'd love to go back as soon as I possibly can. To be honest, um, I didn't know that the, the attack on the protesters was happening. It happened l um, after I got on the plane, and when I got off the Can plane, at, yeah. Yeah. sorry. Actually, my <laughs> my question as well was, will he go tomorrow? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I thought you were asking me whether I'd go back. Well, yeah. well, just well, I know. Well. I know you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Today, um, um, will he go tomorrow? I don't know. Uh, he may go today, to be honest. It looks the situation is so tense and so fast moving. If the army is uh, either obliged to, or wants to, or is forced to um, uh, take action, he may well go today. But of course, you know, I think the point you're making is that uh, the, the day of prayer has, has been one of the huge days of mobilisation mm -hmm. in the past. There are calls, as we know from demonstrations, to make it so. Uh, uh, again, if they do do that. I think Mubarak is in a very, very serious position as well. I mean, uh, it, I, I've, I don't think I've ever heard a British Prime Minister make so direct an undisguised attack on another head of state as David Cameron uh, did. So I think the international community are now saying, look, we have vital interests um, in this part of the world. We cannot have a full-blown revolutionary process taking place. We want the lid put back on this as quickly as possible, and we think that that means you've got to go. Um, so the pressure is definitely building up both domestically and internationally on Mubarak. John, thank you very much.